It's showtime. Calling Chris Anderson in London. How are you today? I am hot as Hades, but doing well. How are things in Chicago? Things are good. How hot is it, Chris? Uh, it got up to 95 here in London today. Oh. Yes, and London's not really built for that kind of temperature, so it's a little toasty. 95 in the fog? In the fog, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really, that's awesome. It's about 82 here. Very lovely day. We do have had a bunch of people congregating on the lakefront, so our mayor has taken after them uh, with a vengeance and closed cool. down some places to keep them from doing that. She's a tough customer. Uh, welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour. Uh, we're here every Sunday, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. 4 p.m. Eastern, talking about history on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. Wow, and look, there's people here. It's just Dawn's here. It's not because of us. It's because it's, Dawn's here. It's, it's very exciting. Joe is here, and Doreen, and Thomas, and Emily. Duncan, um, my buddy Doug. Thomas. Who else? Bob Fry, Ken Harker, Jack Sadler. Wow, from the Hudson Valley to uh, Pennsylvania to St. Louis uh, to Tinian, from Normandy. Eventually, we all have from Normandy. We have everybody joining us. So, Chris, it's almost time to uh, get things uh, going here. Well, I have to like push the right buttons. It's almost time to get things going. You know, you know the Yogi Berra. What did Yogi Berra say? It's not over till the fat lady sings. No, that's wrong. Try one more. It's not over till it's over. Well, he, that's right. he said it both. Okay. Well, I even prepped you on this, and you gave me. The I know. I'm sorry. I, I thought it was coming later. You threw me. Yeah. So, so in our case, it doesn't start till it starts. Are you ready? I'm ready. Seatbelts fastened. Hold on to my seat. And the bar is open. Oh, I remember that part. <laughs> so our, our, our today in history is a pretty somber one. Yes. Uh, 75 years ago today, atomic bomb uh, dropped on uh, Nagasaki with all the attendant death and the impact on uh, World War II. And Chris, that directly relates to our topic and our guest today. And do you want to tell us who they who our guest is and what our topic is? Our, uh, you can remember that, right? That part you're good with? <laughs> our guest today is our good friend Don Farrell. Uh, Don has, has been on the show before, so he's our first guest to make a repeat appearance. Uh, so many of you enjoyed our conversation with Don that we wanted to have him back. Uh, also because the last show we had hoped to get to discussing uh, the atomic missions on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we spent so much time talking about Saipan that we didn't quite get there, so we thought we'd um, make it look like we really thought this through very well and decided to have Dawn back on the anniversary of the second atomic mission. Um, and if you missed the first show, uh, Dawn is probably one of the world's authorities on uh, Tinian and the atomic missions. He's wrote, written a book called uh, Tinian and the Bomb, which is going to be published by Stackpole soon as Dawn, what is it? Uh, atomic the, Island? The Atomic Island. Right, but you can get it now on uh, uh, Kindle. Uh, so uh, we'll be talking a lot about that. But anyway, uh, Don can correct everything I just said because he's joined us. So, Don, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Always happy to be here. Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Uh, it is, I should say, it's 6 a.m. where Don is on the island of Tinian. It's, we are spanning the globe, 3 p.m. in Chicago, and, and who knows, in London, it's so hot and foggy there. Nobody knows what, what time it really is. Um, so, Chris, do you want to start off the questioning, or do you want uh, me to start off the question? We have, we have, you know, it's we we've planned this very carefully. It's spontaneous. We're going well, for. I, I think what we should do is, I mean, obviously, a lot of the news coverage has been talking about the 75th anniversary of the atomic missions. Uh, the last time Don was on, we talked about um, uh, the taking of Saipan and establishing uh, American presence in the Northern Marianas and why that was so important. So I thought it might be a good place to start to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Tinian and how Tinian becomes uh, what I've heard referred to as, uh, you know, the, the biggest aircraft carrier in the Pacific. Uh, so we can start with um, setting up the base at Tinian and, and see where that takes us. 
Very well. Um, the uh, the Manhattan Project had a, a lot to do with the capture of the Mariana Islands. Tinian and well, not just Tinian. Tinian, Saipan, and Guam are all within the range of the B-29 bomber as it was estimated when the bomber was being developed. Most people don't realize that the, the big, the large four engine uh, long distance bombers uh, actually began their creation in 1933 after Hitler became chancellor of Germany and then Roosevelt became president of the United States. For the very first time, the Army Joint Army Navy Board began to consider the idea of uh, creating a four engine bomber that could carry a ton of bombs uh, to our uh, distant borders. Just in case at some time in the future, a, any foreign country might try to invade the United States, either via the Panama Canal uh, coming up through Mexico or from Alaska or from, uh, from Canada. And that led to the development of the B-17 super uh, uh, flying fortress. Uh, unfortunately, the flying fortress, although it did have good range and it was a, a very dependable aircraft, didn't have quite enough range to be able to make the distance from the Marianas to, um, to, to Japan. And so the, actually the president of Boeing Corporation, before he ever got a contract or any funds to do so, began developing a larger four engine bomber that eventually became the B-29. And the B-29 uh, was created specifically for the purpose of bombing Japan from the Mariana Islands. Uh, it could fly at nearly uh, 32,000 feet and be effective, which was above the, the level of uh, the highest flying Japanese uh, interceptor fighter and their, and their anti-aircraft guns. Um, it could carry uh, 10, uh, 10 tons of bombs, 20,000 pounds of, of bombs, and fly uh, a round trip from the Marianas to, to Japan and back. So that development then became critical to President Roosevelt and the, the Army-Navy planners in um, the United States, uh, pushing up the priority for the capture of the Marianas. And, uh, you know, talking about uh, Tinny and the, the base that they built there, as Chris alluded to, it's a it's a huge air base, isn't it, that starts um, uh, being built shortly after the invasion of Tinny. And, and the quote that uh, I actually saw, the quote that Chris mentioned from Philip Morrison, a physicist in the Manhattan Project, it said that this island smaller than Manhattan looked like a, a giant aircraft carrier. What? How big was the air base on Tinian? Well, there are two bases on Tinian. If you look in the this the picture you've got on the screen, in the foreground is North Field. It has four B to four B twenty nine runways. Each of them are eight thousand five hundred feet long and two hundred and fifty feet wide. All the little white dots you see there are hard stands with B-29 sitting on them. There were over 200 of them. Now, up in the upper part of your screen on the, the right central side of Kenyon, you'll see another airfield. That was called Westfield, and it became home to the 58th bomb wing. It only had two runways, but uh, large hard stand storage areas, and it also had 200 B-29s. So altogether, by the end of the war, there were over 400 B-20 operational B-29s on the island of Tinian. The island was constructed by the 6th Naval Construction Brigade. That is 13 Naval Construction Battalions, each with 1,080 men plus 33 officers. So that by the end of the war, there were nearly 15,000 CBs on the island with a million tons of dynamite and 500 bulldozers and all the things that go with not just airfield construction, but they had to build a harbor from scratch in the south for ships to be able to bring in the, the what do they call it, the bombs, the bacon and the beans uh, and the roads that would connect the harbor to these two airfields. All of the camps 
Uh, by the end of the uh, the war, there were 75,000 people living on the island of Tinian. So, Don, as a compare by comparison, how many people live on the island of Tinian now? About 2,000. <laughs> wow. We're, we're waiting for the census. We really don't know. It got up to, we estimate, about 6,000 people at the height of our economic development when the Tinian Dynasty Hotel and Casino was fully operational. And it's gone downhill ever since then and then downhill tremendously over the last two years. Uh, we, we already have questions for our, from our audience and one relates just to what we're talking about. Uh, how much fuel was necessary to keep 400 B-29s flying and what kind of fuel storage capacity? It must have been incredible oh. fuel storage capacity. Uh, the, the job that the, the CVs did was unbelievable because they were simply told to build all of this. And they, they brought in these thousands of men and, and shiploads of, of equipment. But essentially, all of the correct, uh, all the construction projects were created here on the island of Tinian by the CVs themselves. The men of the Air Force and, and the big Navy command simply told them what to do what needed to be constructed, but not how to construct them. So the, the construction facilities that were going on here were massive. It was 24-7. Uh, the roads uh, were one-way roads with uh, military police along the roads to make sure that nobody was on the, the uh, haul roads uh, except CVs hauling. The, the, a, a, a brigadier general visiting the island got kicked off the road by a, by an MP, right? Because he was on the wrong road when the CDs were trying to haul all this in. So, bottom bottom line is, uh, the the work was done by all of these CDs. Uh, many of them were were not, I don't want to say elderly men, but in their fifties. Uh, who had been construction foreman. Uh, they had built... Uh, Just run slow down there on the description of being in your 50s. <laughs> <and being older. laughs> well, I understand you may be a, a, a spry young man, but some of us may have graduated from the 50s already, Don, and are moving on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> these, uh, the guys were ingenious uh, on how to, to get the job done. They were experienced construction workers, with thousands and thousands of young men who uh, wanted to join the war and wanted to learn a trade. And so they joined the Navy and the Navy put them in the CVs and the CVs sent them wherever the Navy needed a base built. And thousands of them came here to Tinia. So just, uh, um, I, I I'm not going to do all the math, but I did some quick checking there while Don was talking. I saw um, you right, I, saw yeah. writing and focused. It was, you know, that could smell so, the smoke. B-29 has uh, two inboard and two outboard wing tanks, and each inboard wing tank is 1,436 gallons. So multiply that by four, then multiply that number by 400, and that's how much gas. They carried, they carried about 6,000 gallons of fuel, more yeah. in tanks. Now, how did they get that fuel to the planes? The CBs actually created, uh, they built fuel tanks on the shore, uh, on the eastern shore of, uh, excuse me, the western shoreline of Tinian. Then they used empty 50-gallon uh, drums to create fuel lines to tanks that were actually on the airfields. And they created a floating a hose system, floating on um, on uh, pontoons that went out to a, a buoy just offshore, so that fuel ships could come in and and tie up to the buoy, pick up the hose, and unload their fuel directly into that hose line, which would take the fuel then uh, all the way into the the uh, ground based tanks. And that's gasoline, jet fuel, all of the other types of fuel that they needed for the various uh, aircraft and equipment that was, was running here. And they had to do that twice, once for Northfield and once for Westfield. So there were huge amounts of fuel being unloaded and just one ship after another because they would run out just like they ran out of bombs. After the, uh, the great fire raid of March 9 to 10, uh, LeMay ran out of bombs and complained to Nimitz that he was out of bombs. And Nimitz said, you couldn't have used all the bombs I sent you. 
And he said, oh, yeah, we dropped, <laughs> them. we dropped them all on Japan and we need more. And so uh, Nimitz changed the order and said that there shall be no less than 60,000 tons of bombs on Tinian at any one time. Wow. Now, that meant that after every mission, which used how many thousand pounds, thousand tons of bombs, more had to be unloaded at the harbor, more had to be uh, moved to the uh, to the bomb dumps uh, and be ready to load on aircraft. I, I, two things came up in your in your this fascinating discussion. One is, did I hear you correctly? that they built a, a pipeline out of uh, 50, 50 gallon barrels. They, 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 didn't have, they didn't have the pipe. So they took empty 50 gallon fuel drums. Joined them together. Cut the ends off of them and welded them together to make a fuel line. Get a pipe out of that. I mean, that, yeah. is, that is insane all by itself. So oh, you think they, they, they sailed all the way from, from California to Tinian and somebody went, I forgot the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a problem with shipping. Remember, okay. there was also construction going on at uh, in, um, on Saipan for oh, yeah. the 78th bomb wing, and then the huge construction on Guam to build all of the new facilities for Nimitz. Remember that he moved his headquarters forward in late 1944, and uh, uh, along with him came all of his commanding officers. Apra Harbor was turned into the largest refueling resupply center in the western pacific the lemay complained that when he looked at the guam development plan building air bases wasn't until page five so um I, wow i mean it's just it's uh it's 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 an incredible effort so how, how i would i we don't we could spend all day in the logistics of yeah. tinian i'm sure chris is like rick you got to move it along but uh, I want to know, like, how many ships a day are pulling up to Tinian with bombs and fuel and bulldozers and stuff? Oh, in the beginning, there was no harbor. So the ships <laughs> the anchored harbor. offshore, about a half mile offshore, and they used LCTs. Those are smaller landing craft. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's yeah, landing ship, uh, craft tank. And they would go out to the ships, download the cargo into those little uh, uh, LCTs, run them into shore, unload, go back and get, and it was, so it took a full day to do one boat. But at the same time, different groups of CVs built a brand new concrete harbor with finger piers that would hold about nine of these Liberty ships, they called them. They were the, the fast build ships by Kaiser Corporation. Cheap and right? these, yeah. They could handle nine of those at a time inside of the harbor. Uh, the only thing they could not unload inside the harbor was ammunition, bombs, right? So uh, uh, the unloading uh, became a, a, with three CV units and two stevedoring units, constantly at work, 24-7, uh, seven days a week. So this is, this is a, like an inside funny tour story, but when I did my first tour with Don, we had the whole group there, and Don said, Chris, why don't you tell, explain to people a little bit about uh, the Normandy landings and how big that was. So I did the whole little rundown there, and I said, you know, lands 150,000 men the first day, 6,000 chips, and all of a sudden, Don just starts laughing. He's like, is that all? <laughs> and then he proceeded to talk about what was involved on setting up the harbor at Tinian. So uh, it's you have to remember that Tinian is 1,000 miles away from the closest support base. So the big difference between uh, Normandy landing and, and the CNMI, and as well as the, the, the bombing uh, programs from, from England versus the bombing programs here, you were a thousand miles away from your support facilities. So logistical planning was a big, a big part of the entire program. You know, I'm sure that Chris has a very content-filled question he's about to ask, but no. before he does that, I, I've been reminded that we didn't check in to see what uh -huh. cocktails everybody has, or in Don's case, I think it might be coffee. But Chris, what do you have in your? I have a Newcastle. Okay, and I. Well, point it out to Don. See, that's the color beer is supposed to be. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, no. So this is a, a an IPA here in the U.S. of A. And uh, and what is what is the morning drink uh, there in uh, Tinian? Well, 
I'm still on coffee, my friend. Oh, well, let's, uh, see the mug. let's see the mug. What's it say? He said, uh, hold your mug up to the camera so we can see it. My, this is from my, let's see if I can figure that out there. there you go. Proud grandpa of an airman or maybe of Iron Man. You're the grandpa of Iron Man? That's amazing. <laughs> no, no, airman. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. My, gra my granddaughter is a first sergeant in the United States Air Force Security. She's trying to make up for all your past transgressions. Wow, yeah. How'd she get that yeah. job with uh, with your security record? <laughs> I have no idea. She denied any knowledge of me. Oh, okay. Smart move. <laughs> Farrell, Farrell. I've never heard of Farrell before. <laughs> so anyway, um, we wanted to focus a little bit about the, the atomic missions on this show and not get sidetracked. Um, so, <laughs> which we're yeah, doing. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, but right. so... 75 years ago, uh, we have these two missions. So t tell us a little bit about the Manhattan Project comes to Tinian. I know they had some certain uh, unique situations they worked in. There was a little bit of ill will with some of the other B-29 units on the island because they were treated a little differently. So just kind of set the scene there for when, when the 509th. Hey, very good. Thank you. Uh, well, the big question is why Tinian? All right, they, they had their choice of three islands, Saipan, Tinian, or Guam. For a long, during the planning period, even before the Marianas was captured, it was estimated that Guam would eventually become the base of operations for the Manhattan Project in the Marianas, simply because it was going to be Nimitz's headquarters, therefore security would be very high, uh, and, and uh, the activities there would, would have plenty of workshops and equipment and materials for um, the construction of the Manhattan Project facilities necessary to be able to launch the bomb. Uh, and then in, uh, uh, it was late, uh, 1944, somebody in Nimitz's office, a colonel of the Marine Corps, uh, saw some kind of a message passing through that, that talked about the, uh, the assignment of something called a composite group to the Marianas. And he passed that on to Admiral Nimitz. And Admiral Nimitz sent it back to, to DC and said, what is this composite group that you guys are sending me and I know nothing about? So at that point, uh, General Groves realized it was time to read Nimitz into the Manhattan Project. He was totally unaware. Nobody in the Marianas at that time knew anything at all about the Manhattan Project. So uh, uh, Rhodes sent a guy named Dick Ashworth, later Vice Admiral Ashworth, to Guam with a letter from uh, Admiral Ernest J. King, Chief of Staff, United States Navy, both Air Force, and, I mean, both uh, Atlantic and Pacific, uh, saying, uh, dear Nimitz, uh, this man's going to tell you about a, a, a project that we're working on and the we want to put it in the Mariana Islands, and he's there to find a location for, for this base of operations. And we, I would appreciate it if you'd give him your full support. And you can only tell one other person. Mm. So Ashworth flew out. He landed the week before the invasion of Iwo Jima. So Nimitz was in no mood to talk to then Commander Ashworth. Um, and uh, but uh, when he found out that Ashworth had a secret message directly from Ernest J. King, what could they do? So they let him into the office and he pulls out this uh, this letter from King and he hands it to Nimitz. And Nimitz reads it. And so with that, uh, uh, Ashworth reads him in. In other words, he says, we're, we're working on this new bomb. Uh, it's a super secret project. Uh, and we think it'll be very important to the war effort, and we need to, to establish a base and appreciate your help. So Nimitz turns him over to LeMay. LeMay uh, sends him uh, to Saipan and says, well, you can go up there and check out Saipan, and after Saipan, check out Tinian, come back here to Guam, and we'll make a decision. So uh, Ashworth flies to Saipan, and he finds that Saipan is already over congested. Saipan has already got the 73rd bomb wing in operation with only two runways. They don't have space available for another bomb group. He goes to Gua to Tinian, and all of a sudden he finds thousands and thousands of CBs doing nothing other than building air bases and all of the connecting roads and everything like that. And uh, 
He, he is toured around the island by Brigadier General Frederick von Harten Kimball, the island commander, who is a 7th Air Force man. And uh, again, he doesn't tell Kimball anything about the bomb. He just says, I need some space. And he looked around the island and then he flies down to Guam and he, he sees that Guam cannot uh, uh, handle the, a new operation. They're, they're too deeply involved in other things. And so he sits down at a table and he draws a circle on an aerial map of Tinian and he says, uh, this is where we want to put our operation. And so with that, it goes to um, Admiral Hoover, Johnny uh, Hoover, who was commander forward areas and he was in charge of all construction in the Marianas. And he says, whatever Admiral King says you want, you get it. And with that, he flew back to, to uh, D.C., met with General Groves, told General Groves about it, showed him the map. And uh, Groves then sent him to Brigadier General Norris, uh, 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 Norstad, right, who then agreed that Tinian would become the base. This is an excellent map you have on the screen now. It shows uh, Tinian. Now, just north of Tinian is Saipan, of course, and just south of Tinian is Guam. But these are the actual flight patterns that were used by, uh, by, on, on both bomb missions. Notice that the Enola Gay mission went to I Iwo Jima. All B-29 missions headed to Japan had used Iwo Jima as a rendezvous point. So they all knew where it was. It was easy to find. And then from there, they flew directly to Hiroshima. Uh, the other mission, though, uh, could not use Iwo Jima because the weather had turned. So they identified this tiny little island there at the end of Kyushu uh, called Yakushima. And that was to be their rendezvous point. Um, uh, Dutch Van Kirk, who had been the navigator on the, on the uh, Hiroshima mission, said, uh, your men are never going to find that place for a rendezvous. And of course they swore they would, but when they got there, they didn't, uh, couldn't. And so they did not have a full mission. Uh, and then they flew to Kakura, found out that it was also uh, clouded in, could not drop the bomb there. Flew to Nagasaki, dropped the bomb on the first pass, and then uh, successfully managed to make it to Okinawa to make an emergency landing on a B-24 runway there. All right. okay. Now, let's not get too far ahead of that, though, because we have to. We'll come we have back to, to that. I'll come back to that. Okay. So, did you? It's did you have a question? Well, so, uh, so what kind of special preparations had to happen at Tinian to drop the bomb? Because you know, if you don't know anything about this, you say to yourself, "Well, it's one bomb. It's okay. a plane that can fly so high that there's no fighters to that can reach it. So how hard, hard is it to have one plane fly one bomb to Japan? Because the bombs weren't ready. It, many people believe that the bombs were assembled in uh, Los Alamos and then shipped to Tinian, prepared to use. And that's not true. The bombs were not finished. There were many parts still under manufacturing, still under testing. They knew that they weren't going to be fully ready early on. So they sent Colonel Elmer E. Kirkpatrick, there's the little boy bomb, the uranium bomb, uh, uh, on August 5th, the day before the dropping. That's Dr. Norman Ramsey, the chief scientist on Tinian, watching Dr. Uh, Edward Dahl uh, painting the L-11 on the side of the plane. You'll see the bomb is open. They're ready to insert the final piece of uranium in there. But anyway, uh, Kirkpatrick came to Tinian in March, right after Ashworth. His job was to build the facilities like this uh, assembly building, uh, three of them, uh, at Northfield on Tinian, where the bombs would actually be assembled. The parts were then shipped to Tinian. Uh, the, the Indianapolis carried only the tungsten shell casing for the bomb as well as half of the uranium. All of the other parts for the bomb and all of the parts for uh, Batman, the, the uh, uh, plutonium bomb, were shipped by air. They were flown in and there was a special area, another area also built under the direction of Kirkpatrick by the 67th Naval Construction Battalion, 
uh, it was called the high tech area. All of the parts were taken from the harbor or from the airport, depending on where they arrived, and, and taken to this high tech area where they were stored. And then as technicians began to uh, arrive in, in May, uh, they began the process of sorting out all of the parts and doing the sub assembly. The sub assemblies then were taken up to the assembly bomb area, all right, for final construction. There were enough parts shipped and flown to Tinian and put into the high tech area to build 50 bombs. Wow. Did they now, think that they might need 50 bombs? Gentlemen, what does that tell you we were really doing on Tinian? Preparing to drop 50 bombs. Yep. Actually, they really, really did hope that one would do it, if not one, two. But in the words of, of uh, their own scientists, technicians, and the admirals and generals, they were prepared to drop as many bombs as necessary to force the Japanese surrender. There was not going to be an invasion of Japan, especially after the, uh, the July 16th Trinity test demonstrated what the atomic bomb could do. Now, the little boy bomb was never tested. They didn't have enough uranium. It was so difficult to separate the isotope uh, uranium-235 from the raw ore, which was uranium-238, uh, that they could only manufacture enough of the refined uranium to make one bomb. And they saved all of that uranium for that one little boy bomb, L-11. Uh, so the test at Alamogordo, all that did, and it was, a, it was a laboratory experiment. The laboratory simply happened to be an open desert, right? And they ran wires to a tower with the gadget on the top of the tire tower. And the scientists threw the switch just as if they were in a laboratory. And boom, it went off. So the only thing that did was prove that a nuclear bomb could be exploded. But it did not prove that uranium could be exploded nor did it prove that the material could be put into a bomb, flown all the way to Japan, dropped from 30,000 feet, and still explode. Hmm. So both the Hiroshima uh, uh, drop and the Nagasaki drop were actually experimental uh, drops. And then they were prepared. If that didn't work, they, were pre they, they already had the next uh, Fat Man bomb in production, only waiting for the delivery of the plutonium. Don, one of the, I mean, one of the stories that I enjoy that uh, you tell, and I'd like you to kind of expand on this a little bit more, is, but um, Deke Parsons, because when we talk about the first mission, um, you know, everybody thinks it's Colonel Tibbetts, it's his mission, he flies the bomb, he drops the bomb, and he's the guy, but he's not. And, um, you know, you tell that wonderful story about, you know, Parsons, he's the guy that's going to actually do that final assembly on the bomb, and I was, I was just reading some notes today, in fact, um, and you'll get into this, but he talks. You know, he's gonna he's gonna put the do the final uh, assembly there in the bomb bay of the plane. And somebody asked him. He said, "Well, have you ever done this before?" And he said, "Oh, no, but I've got all afternoon to figure it out." Yes, that's exactly it's true. Just how yeah. improvised it all is, even up to the end. Everything was improvised, right? I, I mean, the people that they brought out here, the people who were involved in the Manhattan Project in general, were were the brightest of the bright. And they were all they were all handpicked and well vetted. Uh, but Captain Deke Parsons, William S. Parsons, William Sterling Parsons, uh, nicknamed Deacon while he was at the uh, at the Naval Academy because he always walked around like a priest or something. And uh, uh, he was a specialist in uh, ordnance, Navy ordnance. He had developed the uh, five inch Navy. Uh, the fuse for the five-inch Navy anti-aircraft uh, gun shell uh, that was used in destroyers and cruisers and, you know, all other ships by the end of the war. Proximity fuse, right? Yeah. Proximity fuse. So, you know, in, in the previous times when they fired a gun, it had an altitude, uh, uh, anti-aircraft gun, it, it had an altitude on it or a distance on it, right? And, and exploded there, whether there was an aircraft or not. What he did was create a, a fuse that is that would would blow up 
as soon as it came in proximity to an aircraft. And to prove that it worked, that his new bomb, his new shell, his new gun shell uh, would work, he demanded to be sent to the front with a load of the shells to try them out. And so he did. He took them to the Southwest Pacific. Uh, he convinced the captain of a uh, of a Navy destroyer to load all of his guns with his new shells. And then he said, "Now we gotta we gotta go find somebody that'll that'll fly airplanes at us and shoot at us," which of course. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't exactly what the captain of that ship wanted. The thing that you want, right. right? But you know, you heard what was happening, and so they flew into danger. I mean, uh, sailed into danger. And as the as the Japanese came out, that proximity fuse worked, and they shot down plane after plane after plane, uh, and with no damage to the destroyer. I I, would, so, would, I I have to jump in and say here. That, you know, that this is attracting of attention, enemy attention, sounds like just something that the ghost army would have done. Oh, <laughs> oh, right. But anyway, Deke Parsons has created the proximity fuse and now he's- So he comes, so he comes home and and the, the, uh, the Navy guys know about him because of what he's done. The Army Air Force and the Army Corps of Engineers guy did not know him. And when, when Groves couldn't find a man that he wanted to be his chief ordnance officer, it was William Admiral William Purnell, a uh, member of the Military Policy Committee, who stepped forward and said, hey, we got, a, we got a guy for you. Do you mind taking a Navy guy? And Groves said, no, I'll take anybody if they can do the job. And so Parsons then joined the Manhattan Project on the condition that after he created the bomb mechanism, not the nuclear gadget, but the bomb, the bomb casing and all that goes with making the bomb go off, right? Um, he would be allowed to take it into combat uh, in the first, first instance, just as he had done with the proximity shell. And that's why he became the bomb commander on that flight. And you are exactly right, Chris. Tibbets did not do the job. Tibbets was simply the, the very best B-29 pilot in America. He had participated in the, uh, the test flights of the B-29 since it first came off the production line. Uh, there's Paul Tibbets right, right before leaving for Hiroshima, uh, wave, waving at the, the photographers and everybody there on the tarmac. But um, anyway, the... Uh, the the uh, the bomb was uh, totally prepared by the, the use of the bomb was prepared by people other than Tibbets. Tibbets's job was to train these green uh, pilots from the 393rd Bomb Squadron on how to fly a B-29 in combat. And then he was to fly the actual combat, the first combat mission. So he was the best pilot, he was a good trainer, but he was not an administrative guy. So they surrounded Tibbets with people who had very high qualifications in administrative ability when they created the 509th Composite Group. So around the 319th Bomb Squadron, those 15 aircraft, he had uh, administrative people, mechanical people, service people, squadrons all combined together to create this composite group that could be sent theoretically anywhere in the world to operate in the field to assemble and deliver atomic bombs wherever needed. And as Tibbets himself said, uh, uh, when he first started the program, Germany was still on the target list. So Don, um, oh, I'm sorry, Rick, do you want to? Oh, no, Chris, I wouldn't dare. <laughs> I didn't know when I did the Ghost Army thing, I'd used up. Oh, oh wait. Oh. Back to you. There, there you go. What did you say, Ghost Army? Uh, there you go. Cheers. Go ahead. All right. So, um, obviously, an Gay and the mission. <laughs> her, see what I put up with? Her, see what I put up with? Her oh. gets a lot of attention. Um, but one of the things that uh, you and I had talked about, uh, we talked about quite a bit, is it's really the Nagasaki mission that kind of puts a stop to it. Or it? So why don't, So let's say now that Tibbetts has flown, we've dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, 
Um, the world is shocked. But uh, the Japanese by no means are ready to surrender yet. I mean, there are still people saying we should keep fighting. So we're going we're gonna to send a second mission. Um, again, one of the things that, that just amazes me is when you read about Enola Gay, it seems like everything on that mission went just about perfectly. It did. Perfect mission. That's why I call it uh, the milk run. Right. And, but, no fighters, no fighters, everything perfect. There's Enola Gay backing up to the uh, bomb pit uh, at Northfield Tinian, being backed up. He's being pushed back. You ever but, try to back a trailer right, <laughs> into your garage? Imagine trying to back up a 130,000-pound uh, B-29 and get the bomb bay directly over the bomb pit. There's L-11 in the bomb pit. That's Norman Ramsey watching. You see a guy down inside the pit. They've just taken the tarp off the bomb. But anyway, uh, to go back. Yes, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just, it's 75 years ago today, the second mission. Yeah. It's flowing. It's a totally different thing. When they got back Talk about from, that. When, yeah, when they got back from the Hiroshima mission, the next morning, they were flown to uh, Guam. Now, this is August 7th. They get to Guam. Um, they have a press conference. And then they meet with LeMay. And now LeMay's weather guys have already sent him a message saying um, the weather over uh, Japan is going to go bad on or after August 9th. So that meant that they either dropped the bomb on August 9th, the morning of August 9th, or they would have to wait at least another week. Well, that spoils then the one-two punch idea that Purnell had, uh, had developed right to make to shock them knock them off balance and then knock them out with the second punch and so they moved the atomic bomb mission up to august 9th dr norman ramsey who was in that meeting said well we're not prepared to really be ready until august 11th but if you insist on flying it on august 9th we will do our best to make it ready but we'll only give it a 70 percent chance of working oh. Yeah. Oh, so now the decision comes, who's going to fly the mission? <clears throat> this is a controversy that I, I do not discuss in depth in my book because uh, people warned me about talking not friendly towards General Tibbets, right? Oh, but the bottom line was Tibbets was now, because of the Hiroshima drop, he was famous around the world. And his fame would live on in history forever, no matter what happens with the second mission. He assigns the second mission to be flown and commanded by Major Charles Sweeney, who has never flown in combat. He had uh, two other men in, in the 509th Bomb Group, uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel uh, Claussen, who uh, had earned the Distinguished Service Cross in B-17s in uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, uh, Captain Fred Bark, uh, who had also flown B-17s in combat, they were bypassed for Tibbetts' very close friend, Chuck Sweeney. Mm. Why did Tibbetts not fly the second mission? What he told uh, General LeMay, and LeMay was very concerned, was that he had trained all of these people, that they had all flown on the Hiroshima mission in a different aircraft, but with him, they knew exactly where to go, what to do, uh, and that he had all the glory that he needed. And he wanted to give somebody else a chance to get some glory. Now, I'm not sure that I buy that, right? <laughs> it sounds to me more like Tibbets, who knew that the 509th bomb group, after the war was over, was going to become a bomb wing and America's strike force. And he wanted to be the commander of that strike force. He had been lobbying for it in Washington, DC already. My guess is that he decided that it was better to let somebody else try that mission rather than ruin his perfect record. No, so anyway, so <laughs> with that said, so Sweeney's right? the commander. 
All right. So he gives it to Sweeney. Sweeney is honored. All right. Uh, He's flying this plane, right? And so, well, the, he flies box. There's cars. a switch, right? So There's a switch in airplanes. It, yeah, it wasn't his airplane. That plane belonged to Fred Bach. That's why it has the name Box Car. All right, Fred Bach. So because the Enola Gay and the great artiste were already rigged for the other mission, right, they did not use Enola Gay. They switched it over to use the Box Car, right, an unfamiliar aircraft to... Uh, to Sweeney, and all of the other aircraft were changed, and the flight crews were changed because Sweeney was now the mission commander. Well, uh, they got ready. The weather turned bad. They could not uh, use Iwo Jima. They had to find this little island called, in other words, by the time that plane was ready to take off, Sweeney knew, or, I'm sorry, Tibbets knew that there could be problems. At any time, because he was commander of the 509th Bomb Group, at any time he could have shown up in his flight suit and said, never mind, I think I better fly this myself. He had the authority to do that. Besides that, he had Admiral Purnell, General Thomas Farrell there uh, to back him up, and they would have immediately approved it. And it would have been Tibbets flying this mission. Would it have gone any differently? Yes, I think it would have. Sweeney did make some mistakes. He but got the gun done eventually. But they, right? they, they did Sweeney, Sweeney and Tibbets knew that there were problems before they even take off. I mean, there's a fuel pump that doesn't work for the aircraft. So if they if if Tibbets would have said, never mind, I'm gonna fly it in Enola Gate. And they loaded it into Onola Gay using the same crew, same aircraft, same crew. Uh, they would have eliminated at least half of the problems that Sweeney ran into. But maybe it sounds like you're not a huge fan of Paul Tibbetts, Don. Well, it's, look, Tibbetts was a great pilot, right? And what he did in Europe and North Africa with B-17s was amazing. He did train that crew, and they did... Uh, they did complete the mission. So, you know, I, I don't want to be a total detractor of him, but the man's got an ego. Look, his book uh, uh, about the Enola Gay's flight to uh, Hiroshima uh, was published shortly after the war, of which he got proceeds, of course, and he owned the book. He republished that book every 10 years. On the anniversary, every 10 years, he republished the same book, under a different title. So guys <laughs> like me who didn't know it were doing yeah, research. the book. I bought the new book. What's and, that saying, Don? You're like, you know, tw twice fooled, third time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I got all, all of his books, right? And he got all the royalties to the books. Then when he gets out here, get this. We get him to Tinian and everybody's, oh, we're going to get to meet Tibbets, right? And so we go into the, the hall and of course, there's other people there participating in this event. But uh, he had a, his publicist came with him and brought the latest edition of the same book, Return of the Enola Gay. And uh, uh, we go through the line to buy the book. We pay for the book. And then uh, we said, how about a signature? And he says, yeah, right over there. That'll be another $10. Oh, I got to write that down. That's a good one. <laughs> I should use that. Anyway, so, but I want to, I want to, I don't, I don't want to run out of time without giving credit, full credit to Sweeney and the team that made the job go. Now, Dick Ashworth, the guy that had come to Tinian in February and picked the sites for the construction, he became the bomb commander, right, right on the Nagasaki mission. Like Parsons was in Hiroshima. Behind Sweeney. So they went, they flew to, they got to, to, uh, Yak Yakushima, uh, the um, uh, uh, V90 uh, didn't show up for uh, for the rendezvous. They waited for him 45 minutes. Then they flew on to uh, Kokura, uh, made three passes at Kokura, couldn't and, find it. And Don, I just want to Don, I want to yeah. jump in and say, uh, if, if if people are like me, they probably have no idea that Nagasaki wasn't the primary 
target that this other oh, city could call the primary target. It was a major manufacturer. It had been a primary target for B-29s all through the war, and they couldn't knock it out. So that was top of General Arnold's list of targets to be knocked out. Besides that, there's a tunnel that goes there between uh, Kyushu and, and Honshu. He wanted to see whether or not it would destroy the tunnel and cut off transportation between the two. So anyway, they get uh, they, they can't drop it on, on Okura. Finally, in desperation, they head to Nagasaki, which is headed towards Okinawa. Uh, it, it turns out to be cloud covered. Uh, at first, Ashworth was not going to allow them to do a radar drop because it was against the rules, and he's an Annapolis guy. And, and then at the last minute, he realizes, well, it's either that or, or dump it in the ocean or try to land with it on Okinawa. Nobody wanted to do that. So uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the navigator, Bihan, uh, was staring through the sights of his bomb and it, uh, his uh, bomb site, and uh, uh, as they were crossing Nagasaki, they crossed a hole in the clouds. He saw the target area, not the aiming point, but the target area. And he said, this is Nagasaki. Uh, Ashworth is behind him and said, let it go. And bang, it was gone on, on Nagasaki. Sweeney then showed superlative flight skills to be able to get that plane, which was virtually, they had three hours to fly and three hours of fuel. And he got it to Okinawa and managed to land it on a 24 or on a, a B-24 runway, which is only half as long as the B-29 runway. And so the mission turned out to be successful and Sweeney needs to be uh, given credit for the successful drop because this was the decisive mission. It was that night when they found out that a, a second bomb had been dropped on Nagasaki that Hiro, uh, uh, Emperor Hirohito realized that now the Americans had more than one of these bombs. There was no defense against them. There was nothing that the military clique could say or do about it. And he gave the order, called the war off and to write the surrender message, which was, uh, they worked on it all night, sent it out very, very early the next morning to the Swiss and Swedish embassies in Europe for transfer to the allied powers. Uh, giving their initial uh, surrender. Uh, by then, Sweeney and his crew were all smashed. They, when they, got, <laughs> they, they got in. They got into the uh, medicinal alcohol and uh, got, got just got shit faced, right? And managed to. They stole the, uh, General uh, uh, Farrell's jeep. And actually drove it right into one of the one of their tents. Couldn't stop it, and they were all crashed out when the message uh, that the surrender uh, had been made got to the airwaves. They woke up in the morning knowing that their bomb had brought the war to an end. So, Don, um, this is the kind of anniversary where everybody asks these questions that, that puts historians like you on the spot, and there's still yeah. still a lot of debate. Um, about the dropping of the bomb. So I'm going to try to wrap a couple of questions into one. Um, you said that we hit were, you know, we prepared to drop as many as 50 bombs on Japan. So we're, we're ready then to, in effect, obliterate Japan. And that would have, do you think that we would have just kept bombing them until, because I mean, that's a lot of atomic power. Uh, I, I hate to spec. Yes, we would have dropped the third bomb. There's no question. As a matter of fact, General Spatz wanted it dropped on Tokyo. So that if so Tokyo, yep. Yeah. So if so, it, is it the bombs that end the war? Because one of the other arguments that we get here, or we get over here, is it? They is it, not know. Yeah. Is it they Japan? Is it Russia's invasion of Japan that finally gets them to stop, or is it the bombs? Well, I, the argument about the uh, Russian intervention, the Russian entry in the war on uh, at midnight on August eighth, right? has been, uh, some people have tried to give it credit, right, yeah. for ending the war. But if you read um, uh, Emperor Hirohito's surrender statement, if you read the statement that he made to his, his uh, war cabinet, uh, the night that he told him to, to issue the surrender statement, uh, he never once missions uh, the Russians. 
but he refers directly to this cruel new bomb against which they have no defense. So personally, I give the majority of the credit to the bomb. Undoubtedly, uh, the entry of the Russians, though, was an influential factor. The, uh, you know, we, we, we can't let this anniversary go by without noting the terrible, devastating impact of uh, the yeah. bomb that was dropped. This is a photo of the bomb on Nagasaki. Uh, this is a photo of the bomb damage on Hiroshima. But and one of our audience members said, well, were, were we ready to obliterate Japan? But the truth is we were already doing that. We had already destroyed 67 cities the size of Cleveland. All right? We had burnt them to the ground. We had killed far, far more people burning them to death than were killed by the atomic bombs. The atomic bomb, of course, uh, became an issue in the 1960s. Uh, with with the Cold War threats, remember the the face down with uh, Khrushchev, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev, uh, and and so the anti nuclear uh, 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 program, you know, the anti nuclear activists uh, actually took control of the history of the bomb. They do not mention the number of people that were killed by aerial uh, bombing, by incendiary bombing. Uh, and and that, that's unfortunate. It's cast a, a spell on it. On the other hand, as somebody else, uh, others have mentioned, by using those bombs at that time. Now, remember that these bombs were, were the very first. They were amateurish compared to the bombs that were, were ready by, by the 60s. Uh, Perhaps dropping those two bombs, uh, despite the, the death and destruction that they caused, were enough to, for international leaders to recognize that we just can't use this bomb again. And that's why it has never been used since World War II. And not only that, but the dropping of the bomb allowed us, first of all, it prevented the Soviet Union from getting a piece of the action in Japan after the war, the, uh, you know, like what happened to Germany, right? The division of Germany into four pieces and all of that. Uh, Truman made sure that Germany, uh, that Japan remained unified. And because the bomb was dropped and the war was over so suddenly, no Marines had marched through the streets, shooting men and women and children with pitchforks. Uh, uh, the, the Japanese were simply in shock. And uh, MacArthur, much to his credit in this particular case, uh, was able to work with Hirohito and used Hirohito and his influence to help create the new Japanese, uh, democratic Japanese country. And that led to the peace in the Pacific that we've enjoyed over the last 75 years and led to the very first tourism industry in the Marianas, the first hotels, the first tourism hotels owned on Guam were built by Japanese. The what? first hotels built on Saipan for tourists were Japanese hotels. Well, and I was going to ask, that is a, a beautiful uh, way to kind of wrap up the, that story. I was just going to take it to today and ask you very briefly, because we're near the end, uh, is, you know, is, is, there, is there anything still there uh, on Tinian that represents this? And I, I know there is, but, but tell us a little bit about what's, what's still there that people can see when they go on a Stephen Ambrose historical tour there with Chris Anderson and Don Farrell. And Our number, the number one tourist site on Tinian is the atomic bomb pit near Runway Abel, right? And the atop, there it is. Uh, you'll see it's now encased in a, in a plexiglass bubble. The photographs you see in there uh, are from the National Archives. I, bought, uh, that I, I photocopied those in uh, Washington, D.C. and brought them back. Uh, and, of course, that's our National Historic. Uh, no, that's an incorrect statement from the National Park Service claiming that this is where the uh, little boy was loaded and the fat man was loaded in the other bomb pit when it, actually this bomb pit was used for both bombs. We now know now that they're emptied out. Uh, there's also the, uh, the um, uh, flooring, right, for the assembly building. You can stand in the spot. Chris has stood there, 
right, where the little boy uh, was actually assembled and then taken to the bomb pit where it was loaded. So, yes, those are the number one tourist attractions on the island. And I've been up there many times uh, in the past when we had tourism uh, with busloads of Japanese showing up. And, and oftentimes when I was escorting uh, military dignitaries, I had, I, I remember, I had a, a group of Navy uh, admirals and senior officers. Uh, I was actually standing at the bomb pit, telling them the story there. Uh, when a busload of Japanese showed up and these Japanese girls came over and, and wanted pictures of these this Navy admiral. <laughs> so uh, it, uh, I've, learned, I've learned a lot about people from that. Well, Don Farrell, we could do another hour. <laughs> we will. <laughs> we will. Um, thank you so much for joining Thanks, Don. us. Don Farrell is a historian on Tinian. He is the author of, among other books, Tinian and the Bomb. And if you look Don Farrell up on Amazon, all of his books are now available on Kindle, so you can buy them, putting money into Don's hands for, you know, more. Well, I would also add that there, we had a lot of questions we didn't have time for. Yes. Check out Don's book and you'll find the answers in there. And All right. Listen, Chris, if you have questions that I did not get answered, please uh, forward them to me by email. I would be glad to answer them. We well, will do that, Don, and we'll try to post those answers on Facebook. And we thank you very much for getting up early uh, on what is Monday in Tinian and joining us. So thank you. And now you can go have another cup of coffee. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Chris. You guys have a good time. You too. Chris, Stay safe, Don. You can afford air conditioning, I know. <laughs> I don't think they, <laughs> they, have so they haven't invented air conditioning in England yet. But don't so worry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You put a Cheers, Dave. You put a big bin of ice by a fan, Chris. <laughs> blow it on you. It works pretty well. Um, I was looking for a, a history uh, all around us to do, Chris, in relationship to this, and I, I have one, and and it's exciting. It's a video history. You've got to show this. That's really neat. And it's here in Chicago, and you might think, well, what relates to the um, uh, atomic bomb here in Chicago? Some of you will know. But the world's very first uh, uh, atomic reaction, uh, chain reaction, took place under the stands of Alonzo Stagg Field at the University of Chicago uh, under the supervision of Enrico Fermi. And the Alonzo Stagg Field is no longer there, but you still have the, uh, the place. And now there is this sculpture called Nuclear Energy that was put up in... Um, uh, uh, 1967 on the 25th anniversary of the chain reaction there under Alonzo Stagg Stadium. And I think it looks a little bit like a mushroom cloud and a little bit like a skull, both of which the um, uh, sculptor said were intentional, but that it also looks a little bit like a football helmet, which <laughs> seems to me like a third thing since it happened under the stands of a football stadium, even though, in fact, the University of Chicago had shut down their football program three years earlier it's still neat but i do have one question sure you know, I, I appreciate you working video into the history here thing that shows how high tech you are but you shot video of something that wasn't moving at all <laughs> but yeah <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm an artiste. That's I, true. I'm feeling a little underappreciated there. Well, I will say those are the same skills that you used in the Ghost Army. Okay, cheers. I'm done. I I, I am out. Uh, that real. Chris, next week we have a, a really interesting guest coming up, um, uh, and I know you're excited about it too. Uh, Norman Oler is the author of a book uh, called uh, The Bohemians, uh, the Lovers Who Led Germany's Resistance Against the Nazis. And so it's an inside look at a part of the German resistance. Yes, there was one. There was one. Uh, from a German author who lives in Berlin. Uh, and so that should be really different and really fascinating. Yep, looking forward to it. And thanks for joining us today. Come back next week. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your being here. We'll see you next week. Be safe, everybody. Thank you.